and then everybody comes in and finds their place to sit. And then when the sit begins, after everybody's done, then they hit the fish. And that's it. Nobody gets up, nobody moves, everybody stays there for that period of time. And you don't need um, any clocks or anything. There's one person designated um, who keeps uh, time. And traditionally, the, you would sit to the uh, length it took to burn an incense stick. Um, now we're using clocks, and so usually it's 45 minutes to an hour sit. After that sits over, uh, the person who's monitoring or proctoring the hall will hit the bell, and that means the sit is ended, and you can uncross your legs and then get up and go to the next. Is this thing on? I don't, we don't really need it on. And then you can turn it off for the room. It, it, the voice is way too big. <laughs> um, so this is the, the rhythm of how it works. And usually, um, thank you, it's done in silence. So part of the routine is for those seven days, you really don't talk or you try not to talk, not only to not disturb others with uh, conversation, but it allows you to focus on yourself, on focus on what's going on in your mind. Um, so this is how it's set up, this is how it's run, and there's quite a few people up there now uh, doing this seven-day retreat. Now there's different kinds. Um, there's a um, the recitation type. <laughs> We're getting our technology set up here. Are we all set? We're okay. Okay, so um, there's a recitation type, and that's the one that's happening this week. Um, and this is using the name of a Buddha or a Bodhisattva usually that's re recited repetitively. So again, it's cyclical. And there's a reason for all the cyclicalness because what it does is creates a backdrop or background that's constant. And when the background is constant and steady, and not changing, the foreground, which is your mind or consciousness, then comes into highlight, relief. So the background here would be the reciting the name of Guanyin, Bodhisattva, the enlightened being of great compassion. Sometimes uh, the recitation is for the Buddha Amitabha. Um, and then there is the silent, totally silent contemplative um, retreat, which is Chan or uh, Zen practice. And there, there's no recitation even. So not only is there not talking, but you don't even do any ceremonies or recitation. You're just sitting. You sit for an hour, you walk for 15 minutes, you sit for an hour, you walk for 15 minutes, you sit for an hour, you walk for 15 minutes, you go have your lunch, you sit silently in lunch, you get the food done, you come right back to the hall. And it's, it's very intensive, very focused. Uh, and then there's uh, another kind uh, of bowing contemplative practice, where you're doing bowing and using bowing as a contemplative foreground to cleanse and watch the mind. So there's all different ways of doing it, but essentially it's the same thing. It's about mind cultivation. And whether it's sitting or walking or bowing um, or reciting, it all has the same function. It's just uh, people like diversity. Uh, and uh, some people find it very hard to sit hour after hour, and they like to then recite instead. Some people find reciting um, too noisy, and they want it quiet, and they like to sit. Um, and it's all okay, but then the first wrong thought that arises when people do this is, yeah, well, sitting is for men, you know. Sitting's the real thing. Those people are reciting are doing, the, you know, a, an inferior practice. So, and the people are reciting, uh, you know, usually say, well, those people are sitting. Their minds are going all over the place. They can't hold them steady. Actually, just reciting the Buddha's name is... An, and so that's the first level of wrong thinking that starts to rise. My method is better than yours. Um, and so this week they're doing a Guan Yin practice. And so what we've done is... We developed a new program, um, and we have two levels, but the graduate level is a master's program of Buddhist classics. And when we designed the program, um, 
we added an element called uh, Buddhist hermeneutics. And hermeneutics simply means, how do you interpret a text? How, uh, when you get a text, what strategy, what methods, what assumptions, what techniques do you use to get at the meaning? And there's different ways that people do this. Some use a psychological apparatus, and let's look at it. Or some use a sociological, or some use um, a, just language only. Uh, some people will use a historical lens and only look at the text as it's, as it's framed. In the, and what we were trying to do with our new program is to ask, well, there's all these lenses that people use. What does the Buddhist tradition itself hold up as a legitimate and important lens. And what we came up with was self-cultivation. In other words, one of the ways of understanding a text is not just to borrow the lens of sociology or history, but to look at the lens itself. In other words, the person that's looking at the text. So the Buddhist tradition has this rich infrastructure of um, techniques and teachings about the observer of the text. Not just the text itself or the lens, but the observer, him or herself. And it's really an interesting approach because what you're saying is the most important and probably most determining lens of how you understand a text is the state of your own mind. And if you can understand the state of your own mind, you'll understand then the lens through which you're looking at the text. Um, and so there's this, within the Buddhist tradition, the texts are then, were traditionally studied in combination with contemplative practice. So you would, you would engage in uh, what we call Shila Samadhi Prashna. You would engage in a lifestyle that was grounded in ethics, and you grounded yourself ethically. Then you did various methods of calming, stilling, concentrating the mind. And from that, you would then look in at the text and see if you could not penetrate deeper through the methodology of clearing up the mental apparatus, the emotional apparatus you're bringing to look at the text itself. And so this is a very interesting methodology. So instead of having just study and then just practice on the side, we decided to integrate it into the course and not, we added what we call the laboratory. <laughs> so the laboratory element of this course is the students go to this seven day retreat and then they do the exercise of honing the interpretive tool, which is themselves. Uh, so this, this is new, we're just pioneering it uh, this semester. So what I did was to go up this week and I met with the students in this seminar um, in the evening a couple of times just to see how the laboratory experiment was going, how they were doing. So I was gonna share some of that with you tonight. Um, this, by the way, is not new. Uh, nor is it unique necessarily to Buddhism, but it is unique the way the Buddhist texts come at this and the depth they go into looking at the looker, <laughs> examining the examiner. They really spend a lot of time. Who is this that's really looking? Through what um, intellectual preconceptions and emotions and feelings are you looking at the lens, at the text? And why does the text keep shifting and changing? And is it because the text is complicated, or is it because you come at it with a different mind and it looks differently every time you come at it? So if you read it, you know, when I would read a text when I first came in, 10 years later I'd read the same text and I was like, wow, this text has really gotten interesting. It was the same text, all that had changed was through 10 years of practice, my way of looking at it had changed. Um, so what we're trying to do now is to bring that together into the course itself. And uh, we thought it's such an unusual approach that maybe the standard accrediting bodies that look at universities would say, uh, no, that's not going to work. That's not the way that we do it. And you guys go back to the sociology, the cultural, blah, blah, blah. They said, no, that's cool. Do it. <laughs> so we got the go ahead to go ahead with this model, which is quite interesting. Uh, so we, what we're doing is we're reading uh, text and passages from primary sources, Theravada, Mahayana, Japanese, uh, Chinese, and so on and so forth. And we're studying those in the classroom. Then when we come to the meditation session like this, I'm asking the students to see if through their meditation practice, the text insights come into the text that they didn't have before just through the reading. 
and also asking them if they can use the text as a lens to guide them through the mind they're exploring. So there's this connection between theory and practice. Okay, so that, that was the, the exercise. Um, actually, I, I, there's a, a line from Thomas Aquinas. Any, you ever know who Thomas Aquinas is? Anybody ever hear of him? He's a great actor. Uh, no. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas was a Catholic theologian. And early on in his writings, in a text he wrote called Summa Theologica, he began with the observation that our ability to know anything is limited and only can go as far as our state of mind. So whatever is out there to be known can only be understood through this. This is very ancient. This goes back to some Taoist stuff. So he said in Latin, it was cognitum est incognoscentis per modum cognoscenti. Everything that's known is known through the mode or the manner of the knower. That was his line. And so if you want to, your real knowing is knowing the knower. But he wasn't a Buddhist, so there wasn't anything he could do with that. It was a great insight. But, you know, had he been exposed to the Buddhist tradition, he'd all, the knowing of the knower has got a rich legacy here that we use in Buddhism. So the students were using it. Now, what happened was, um, oh, and there's another line, like this is really wonderful. This is a metaphor that comes from the Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, and the Avatamsaka Sutra says, it gives this, it says there's a great jewel sitting on a pedestal in a dark room, in the middle of a dark room. Um, and when someone comes in, they barely see it. Maybe they get a little bit of reflection of something there. But if you open the windows, pull up the shades, and you open the doors, the more light you let in, the more all the facets of the jewel start to become clear and wondrous in their you know, an intricate nature and reveal themselves, um, interlacing and interpenetrating this way. And then the text says, the, the sutra is the same way. The sutra is like this jewel, and the light is your own mind. The degree to which you can return your light and collect your light and then bring it out to shine, more facets of the text will reveal itself. So this is the theory behind our combining these two into the course, that having a week of gathering that light back, hopefully, through these contemplative practices, it will increase the magnitude and the illumination that they can bring to looking at the text themselves. And it's not something I do. It's actually something that comes through just going through the practice. So that's how we started. So uh, last night's session was really fun. Everybody came in, and you could tell they were having a session. Some were smiling, some were frowning, some had wrinkles in their foreheads. And so I said, well, so what's happening? And so the first student said, I'm wasting this session. <laughs> so people get really dramatic. If you do this, you know, you have to realize when you do this quietly for, you know, five or six days, a lot of stuff starts to come up. Because once the background is still, all you're dealing with is the chatter and busyness of your own mind. And it's quite a playground. And it's not exactly, you know, the pure land. And so you're going, oh my God, I came here, I was like, I had these images, I saw these people reciting with their beads, and I thought, I'm going to go and really chill out for a week. And the fifth day, you're in a snowstorm, a maelstrom of your own thoughts and emotions and clatia and whatnot. Um, and so she, she just started going, she said, I'm just, I can't control my thoughts at all. They're running wild. Um, and I'm looking at everybody else all the time and wondering, are their thoughts running wild too? Are they passing me by and actually getting enlightened and I'm not? And she was, I said, well, keep going, keep going. Well, okay. And she said, and um, I have thoughts of, I, I think of the past, I think of the future, I can't stay in the present, and then uh, I worry that I can't stay in the present, and then when I worry that I'm not staying in the present, I feel bad and I feel guilty, and you know, <laughs> I said, well, keep going. And she said, and, and then I'm jealous of others, and then I, I'm hankering for these pretty clothes I didn't, but you know, and she's going on and on. And she said, and therefore, all of this false thinking, I'm wasting this session. And I said, okay. Let's start there. That's a good place. <laughs> good laboratory data. Bring it out here. Let's have a look. Uh, and so what we came to was having this come up, having all of this come up, is in fact the point of the session. 
It's not you're wasting the session or having a bad session. This is a good session because it's actually coming up. And it's like, what? I said, well, again, let's go back to the text. The text says we all have the Buddha nature, we all have that potential, but we cover it over with all this stuff. In order to realize that Buddha nature, we have to recognize and deal with that stuff. Oh, so the stuff coming up is not an obstacle, it's actually a portal or an entryway back into. Oh, she going, so that's actually good. And I said, well, it is good, but you're only at first base. So she actually didn't know anything about baseball, so I had to go through <laughs> how that works. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you know, who's on first? So I said, you know, when you play baseball, you hit the ball, you go to the first base, but you don't get a point until you go all around the other bases and come home again. Oh, yeah, I saw that once on TV. I didn't understand. No, that's what you do. So I said, having all that stuff come up is first base, but if you don't do anything with it, if you say, oh, it's all come up, that's really good, then, you know, you're stuck. So the question was, well, where do you go from there? But I said, if you have the thought that all of this false thinking is a wasting of the session, that is a wasting of the session. So it's the false thinking itself is not the wasting of the session, but having the thought that this false thinking is wasting the session, that's the waste of the session. And she's like, oh, okay. So I said, Okay, all of you help her out now. Where will we go with this? Once that's all there, how do we deal with it? Do we just sort of wallow in it and say, look at my mind, you know, it's like a soup, I can't. Or how would you address it? Because having to come up is only first base, how do you get to second and third? So one of the other students said, I know exactly what you mean. I used to be like that. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> and she said, what I do is I use the Vajra Sutra the line from the Vajra we stood and that line was, all conditioned dharmas are like dreams, illusions, bubbles, shadows, like dewdrops and a lightning flash, contemplate them thus. And so she said, when these things all arise in me, I simply go back and reflect. All of these things that are arising are conditioned dharmas. They come and go on their own. They have no lasting power. They're like dreams, illusions, bubbles, shadows. And she said, in doing that, they sort of start to settle, and I bring my mind back to Namo, Guanxi, and Pusai, and it's level again. But then they come up again, and, I go, and she said, I do this process. And I said, okay, so you've taken the theory of the text, and you used it on this experience you're having with the meditation, and the meditation has illumined that theory of the text for you more. It's not just an abstract thing, it's actually a psychoactive uh, technique that you can use. Wow, that's really interesting. And then the first student said, she said, well, I'm not there yet. She said, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying, she said, I'm very scientific, so I'm trying to categorize them. I'm trying to take the good thoughts and feelings and put them in a box over here that I want to keep, and I'm trying to separate out the bad thoughts and feelings and put them in the box in here. She said, that's where I'm at. And um, she says, but there's so many, I can't sift them all. Um, and then I get worried that I'm missing some. Um, and I'm worried, are these really the good ones and are these really the bad ones? Or did I, you know, take a good one and put it in the bad? And so she was back on that. So then the other person said, uh, raised her hand and said, well, she said, I know exactly what you mean. Um, I do that. And she said, what I do in my sessions, I don't, I don't judge myself. My good thoughts and good feelings, my bad thoughts and my bad feelings, I treat them all equally. I like them all. And she said, I really want to hang on to them. I don't want to let go of them. And I want to explore them. So for example, she said, I have this good feeling um, that I'm sitting and it feels really comfortable and I want to just hold on. I don't want to lose that. That's a good thing. And she said, on the other hand, uh, she says, I'm very competitive. And I ask them to keep their own attendance because, you know, you have to, for the university, you have to have attendance. And I said, I don't want to do this. You're on the honor system. Keep your own attendance. And she said, and as I started to check myself off, I wanted to get perfect attendance. I didn't want to be late one minute. And I wanted to be the one in the class who had perfect attendance for the session. So she said, that was a bad thought. And she said, but I couldn't shake it. You know, and it's, so she was, and she, what she was saying was, though, she would try to hold on to the good ones. She tried to hold them, and she said, you know what's happening? I can't. Try as I might, I can't hold on to either of them. And she said, a good feeling comes up, 
and I try to hold on to it, and it fades, and then another feeling comes up. And she says, whether it's bad or good, I can't hold on to either of them. They just keep changing. And she said, often what happens, even if it's good or bad, at some point I get bored with the feeling, and then I just, it just shifts and changes because I'm bored. Or then boredom comes in, and I want to you know, get rid of that, but I can't, and so forth. And she said, the same with my thoughts. A good thought or bad thought comes. I can't get past, she says, she says, I don't time it, but I'm sure it's not even more than a couple minutes. And I can't hold to the thought. I can't keep with it. And I said, so what are you doing with that? She said, well, what I found really useful was this passage uh, that we had from a Theravada text, which was talking about beginning stages of meditation. And there's four mindfulnesses that you use in a systematic way. Um, the first is the mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of uh, feelings, mindfulness of thoughts, and mindfulness of dharma, small d. And the contemplation that the Buddha gave to the disciples is you have a way of contemplating all four of these. You contemplate the body literally as impure. I'll go back to that. You contemplate feelings as unsatisfactory or, or dukkha. You contemplate thoughts as impermanent. And you contemplate dharmas as non-self. So she said, what I was doing was, um, the first one with the body is impure means two things. It means the body is not some jeweled, fragrant place. It's, you know, it's basically the body, all right? And, but it also means it's a composite thing. It's not pure in the sense it's not unalloyed. It's made up of uh, a mixture, earth, air, fire, water, and so forth, and therefore not insoluble. It's, it's always shifting and changing and eventually doesn't stay. Like gold is pure, this isn't. But she said the first one, the body's impure. She said, I was having a good session. I was smelling the incense, and I was thinking, the body's not so bad. And she said, then the break, I went to the bathroom. So in the, in the meditation hall, you have two bathrooms, and everybody's using the bathroom. And she said, uh, just one trip to the bathroom out, I realized, yeah, the first one, I'm body's impure. OK, got it. Uh, <laughs> she came back in. And then she said, uh, the feelings that she was using to say they're unsatisfactory in the sense that each one led to a, a peak and then a decline of boredom and satiation and then dropped off and then wanting another one and dropping off. And she said, in that I could not get anyone and hold it. There was this dissatisfaction, this constant feeling of gain, loss, gain, loss, gain, loss. And she said the thoughts impermanent was really the case. No matter which one I tried to hold on to, I could not. And she started to realize that maybe it wasn't me, she said, but in the very nature of the way the mind works and these things work, that nobody can do this. And so the contemplation is actually a description of the way feelings and thoughts work. And then she said, the last one I'm still working on, all dharma's not self. Uh, she said, I think it might have something to be one, to be number one with a checklist here, but I, I don't, I'll work on that. So uh, that, was, that was hers. Um, let's see if I can recover some of the other ones. Oh, and then finally, um, and this is maybe what I wanted to uh, share with you tonight. If you can put up that text I sent you, I hope you have. Um, the, the other person was very interesting. Uh, she said, I found this particular passage of text really helpful for me. Um, and she was doing, um, yeah. So let's look at this. This is, um, I'll share it with you tonight. It's not the whole sutra. It's just a passage from this. Um, and this is called the mirror uh, analogy or mirror metaphor. And it appears in the um, no, what's that fruit that I eat? I like. Not a papaya. Mango. It comes in the mango sutta. Um, and the Buddha is having this conversation. Rahula is asking the Buddha, you say the way to cultivate is to pay attention to one's intentions, to pay attention to one's mind, to be aware of what we're doing. Mindfulness is the gateway to liberation. Because if one isn't aware of what one's doing, the ramifications still come back, but you're not feeling you're in charge, you don't have ownership. But he said, I don't know how to do this. How do you do this kind of reflective thing? Now, Rahula, some of you know, is the Buddha's son, who then uh, became a monk under the Buddha once the Buddha had left home and family. And he's quite young here. So in this discourse, he's still quite, quite young. He's just a novice. And so the Buddha 
often in cases when the Buddha's teaching, he'll take something that's familiar with someone, like a bridge or a mirror or something, and use it to explain what is not familiar, uh, this concept of self-reflection. And So for him, uh, he, he says, okay, Rahula, what do you think? What is a mirror for? And Rahula answers, for reflection, sir. And then the Buddha says, in the same way, Rahula, bodily acts, verbal acts, and mental acts are to be done with repeated reflection. So let's pause here. These are called the three karmas. And karma means intentional actions. Karma is satana. Intentional actions, not actions that aren't intentional, but intentional actions. And they're done by what we say. They're also enacted through what we do. But even more interesting, they're enacted without verbal and without acting, but only with thought. So mental actions, thoughts, feelings, intentionally activated and engaged in, even though there's no verbal or physical action visible to the outside, create karma. So these are called the three karmas. And most people have an idea that karma is only what we say or do, and what we do in the private space of our own mind, heck, that doesn't matter. But in some ways, that might be more significant. And if you read the text, uh, some of the early texts, they say, in fact, this is the wellspring of what the body and mind do. This is where it begins. So if you can get in at that level, it's much more easy to regulate body and actions because the mind ground is much more attuned and attentive. But let it go wild there, almost invariably in a situation that's going to come out through the mouth and come out through action. But it doesn't mean just because you engage in it mentally and play around with it, there's no consequences. It does ripple through consciousness in the system. And over time, it becomes habit. So that's how thought ways become habitual. Um, so then he says, whenever you want to perform a bodily act, you should reflect on it. This, this physical act I want to perform, would it, in other words, would it lead to self-affliction? to the affliction of others, or to both. Now, he's using klesha here. He's, is this going to cause you to have negative emotions, impediments to clear understanding? And this is then, I won't go through the list of klesha, but this is the marker. In other words, these are things we can feel. Anger, jealousy, uh, worry, anxiety, stress, doubt, and so on and so forth. Um, does this cause, is, will this lead to that in you? Or, what's interesting, will it do that to others? It's both dimensions you're asking. It is, a, is it an unskillful act? Now, this unskillful is a translation of ekusala, or ekushala, depending on how your pronunciation, but meaning that which is not kusala. Kusala means, and this is very hard to translate, I think skillful is pretty good here. Um, generally, some people translate it grossly as good and bad. So good is kusala and bad is ekusala, but that's not what it means here. Some people use wholesome, unwholesome, and that's okay too. But here it means, is it leading toward liberation and awakening? And that's why I think skillful is better and unskillful is it's not working. It's not working to cause this release of suffering and the ending of klesha and the opening of the nature. So is it skillful or with painful dukkha, painful results, painful consequences? If on reflection, you know that it would lead to this affliction to yourself, affliction to others or to both, that you know it would be unskillful with painful consequences, painful results, then any physical act of that sort is absolutely unfit for you to do. And if on reflection you know that it would not cause this, and then to repeat the list, it's not leading to affliction to self and others and so on and so forth, then, and it would be leading to happy consequences, happy results, then any physical act of that sort is fit for you to do. And then similarly, the text goes on to then verbal, you know, and so, I mean, you would end up, if you really followed that, you'd end up getting a lot slower talking. You know, something would come up, okay, now, is this going to lead to affliction itself? Affliction itself? You know, <laughs> you know like, eh, in most cases, you probably not talk. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that happens when people take a vow of silence, they practice the second one. And they're able to, because they can talk, they're able to watch it come up and then do this analysis of it. So if I had said this, would it have led to blah, 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 blah. And it's a really interesting exercise of just examining mouth karma. So the silence, again, 
does the background stopping, which allows the foreground of intentionality to become clearer. And this is what Hung Shir practiced for a good two and a half to three years. Um, he felt, uh, I'm being fair to him, that um, he really didn't have a handle on mouth karma. And so on our pilgrimage, he took a vow of silence. And, and it would, became very intense because he watched what he would say in situations. And a lot of his notes have to do with following this contemplation like this and observing how much before that he had said was not skillful, was not unafflicted, and so on and so forth. Um, and it became a, a tool of rectification of, of the mouth karma. So anyways, now, this is actually a very pragmatic device that you can use if, if you think about it. So if you want to break habit energy, you look at these things that you're about to do, about to commit to, about to eat, about to go to, about to say, uh, about to indulge in mentally, you know, and you ask, where's it going? What's the tendency of this? Is it tending towards this or tending towards that? And at that point, you know, you don't, it doesn't take very long. You start to realize it's tending towards this. What the, what the text is saying, stop there. Don't analyze it metaphysically or anything else. You can just stop physically, mentally, emotionally stop and just say, this is not where I want to go. And uh, somebody in the class then said, yeah, uh, it's like if you taste some food and you get the bad taste in your tongue, you don't want to swallow it and then figure out afterwards. I said, perfect. I said, sometimes in my refrigerator, um, I go in there and um, there's stuff in there and because I live with other people, I don't know. And I open, I go, ooh, you know, due date and everything like that. If I just started taking it down, so it's that immediate. You know that this is not leading to that. Just pull back. You don't have to analyze it any further and find a philosophical reason for it. So it's actually quite orthopraxic or pragmatic. Now, the next level he goes, and this is why I found really interesting when, I, when we got into the text, and she, the student last night, went through this. While you are doing it, this is the next level. So suppose you didn't stop it, okay, before. You didn't consider body, mouth, and mind. You just, all of a sudden, now you're doing it. You're letting it go. The tirade is coming out of your mouth. The, you know, the action, you're right in the middle of that action. Okay, in media res, you're right in the middle of things. While you're performing that act, reflect on it. This is interesting. This bodily act that I'm doing is leading to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both. Is it skillful? Is it, or with, is it having painful now results and consequences? And if on reflection, it's this way, affliction, painful, and so forth, then while you're doing it, stop, right in the middle of it. And if it's not, continue. Now, what this text is, is implying is, at the first, this is very awkward and unnatural, in the same way of learning to ride a bike for the first time. It's, you know, you're trying, you're, you're balancing, going off, and you're falling and whatnot. After a while, this becomes second nature. Because once you learn to read, I'm going to use the meters of attunement, that give you feedback on this, that system starts to function very, very quickly. And you don't even have to contemplate because it's immediately available to you, if not before right in the act of doing it. So one of the ways of testing it is, if you are engaged in something, what is it feeling like at that point of the moment you're engaging in it? What is the feedback you're getting from it? And do you recognize this? And does this have a pattern to it that before when you did it and so on and so forth, you knew it led to this and so forth, and now you're repeating and whatnot. So this becomes a, a heightening of sensibility, of natural sensibility. This is precepting yourself, not by following the rules, but by listening to your own feedback system as it's giving you cause and effect as it's happening. It's really, really useful, and moreover, it's available to anybody. This isn't something that you have to you get esoteric training for. We have this wherewithal at our disposal. It's just a question, do we use it? Because often in the middle of something, we mute over the feedback. We deny that we're feeling this or that in it, and we keep going along that line, even though the warning signs, either for or against, are there. And that's what mindfulness has to do with. It's paying attention to what is obvious. <laughs> Mindfulness is paying attention to what is obvious. It's not paying attention to what is hidden. 
It's only hidden because we cover it over. What, can I sure. What if, what if the, the fe primary feeling you're, get is, you're getting is the gratification of your ego? Okay, let's go. And does that lead to affliction of self, to affliction of others? Does it lead to painful consequences or not painful? See, what you do is you take it through. Where does gratification of ego lead? Presumably to those afflictions that you just said. Right, and so it's actually, it's a very experimental. It's very much laboratory observation. Okay, if I take this and this and put them together, what happens? Ooh, it's starting to bubble and explode. If I gratify ego, where has that gotten me? Like you reflect, where in the past has it gotten me? Where is it getting me now? Where is it likely to get me in the future? And you say, it's a short-sighted strategy, you know, at best. Um, and often gratification of the ego doesn't gratify everybody else. Doesn't even gratify necessarily the significant other I'm with. And when you have deeper reflection, it may not even gratify me. And so who is this me that you're trying to gratify? That begins the next question. Does all indulgence gratify or not? And does all restraint repress or liberate? Mm -hmm. You know, you start to, you're getting in a sophisticated analysis here. But the thing is, you know this. This is available to us. You don't have to study text to do this. He's talking to Rahula, who's a kid. If Rahula can do this, certainly we should be able to. Anyhow. So he says, while you're doing it, go with this. Now, the next part I really like, the next stage, okay, you didn't catch it before, and while you were doing it, you didn't catch it, and now it's done. You're going, hmm. <laughs> Having performed the mental act, physical act, and so forth, then you reflect on it. Did this lead to, has this led to, affliction of self, affliction of others? Was this, in fact, skillful or painful consequences? That's where you go. So you say, I'm gratifying my ego. I know I'm gratifying my ego. I'm going to go ahead and gratify my ego. Now you're done gratifying your ego. Now let's take the inventory. How does it feel? How does it feel? What's the effect on others? How is this working out as a long-term you know, pattern of behavior and uh, a way of living? Hmm. You know, and all, it's, all the Buddha is saying to Ananda, uh, to Rahula, is listen to it. Pay attention to it. You yourself, by doing this, will know how to navigate I don't have to tell you. I couldn't possibly tell you what's right and what's wrong all the time. There'll be so many things that arise. And even if I know thoughts of others, I can't control or dump. But you yourself have the apparatus to steer by here if you only pay attention to it. Uh, and so let's see if we finish up. Having performed the exercise. So he says, and this is really good. It was unskillful. It had painful consequences, painful results. You should feel then horrified, humiliated, disgusted with it. You should not. That'll be your natural reaction once you come to that conclusion. And if on reflection you know it did not, then you should be happy with happy results. You should be refreshed, joyful. Now, the markers are the affective. How do you really feel at the very deep level? Is this, in fact, producing joy, happiness, contentment, and a freedom from worry or care? Or is it producing um, the opposite and a sense of something's coming to come back at me at the result? I, I, you know, and that sense of something's coming at, back at me is, in sense, the natural understanding of karma that we have. I've done something, and there's a feeling like something's off, and it needs to be repaired now. Something's, I set something in motion, and this is not going to bear the fruit that I want to bear. This begins the basis of why repentance and reform is a part of the psychological structure of this practice, because if you got to the third stage, according to how karma can work, the changing of your mind and attitude towards it afterwards actually changes the intensity and the duration of the result of that. So it's fluid and flexible. It's not fixed. Okay, you've done it, too bad. If, you, if while you do it, you have a different change of attitude, it changes the result. And if after you do it, you also, it changes the result. So this would be a long, different class we have on karma, but it's not a black and white thing here. So your intentionality at all times, before, during, and after, change the result of the karma. So in, this is why it's even at the point that you've done it, it's not done and passed, 
change or hope or any correction. Then he says, Rahula, all the priests and contemplatives. And this is a translation of uh, the contemplatives of the shramanas. And the priest sometimes is translated as brahmins and shramanas. And this is the practitioners of spiritual um, activities at the time. In the course of the past, who purified body, mind, mouth, did it through repeated reflection. This is really interesting. Repeated reflection on this. In other words, this was not something they did because they were just following the rules of a book. But they did it in an orthopraxic way, reflecting how does this feel now? How does it feel before? How does it feel after? And then the feeling measurement were these standards, not just a superficial, fleshy feeling, but a profound feeling in my, in my conscience, in the depths of my being. Uh, when I go to sleep at night and reflect, how does that feel in the course of a day, course of a week, even the course of a lifetime of what I've done, and so on and so forth. And taking that in stock, they then orient towards this, and that's how they get to be accomplished, that's how they get to be moksha or liberated, is through this reflection. And all priests in, in the future, in the present, all will go through this same process. This is, in fact, the process of liberation and understanding. It's engaged, and it's reflective. So what she was saying, and bringing this up, she says, therefore, when I'm sitting in this meditation thing, um, if it's, it's, it's right on the cusp of coming up, I try to do this. If I don't catch it and it's actually coming up, I do it while it's there. Where is this going? And she said, I've been down this road before. This one leads to this. Okay, she says, so I feel like I'm wasting the session. Therefore, it leads to um, I'm not worthy. I should leave the session and go chop vegetables in the kitchen because I'm, I'm using the session wrongly. Then it leads to guilt. Then it leads to self-deprivation. Then it leads to I'm hopeless. Then it leads to despair. And she says, having been down that road more than a few times, I can stop here and know where that's going. And she found that very useful. And then she said, and sometimes maybe afterwards I think I didn't get it before, I didn't get it during, but now I look back and realize it went there. I know now not to go down that again. Once burned, twice shy. And so... This reflection I find uh, extremely useful because it's so pragmatic, it's so accessible, and it's so human. Okay? And in a special in a session, when you take this and use it in your practice, and then you use your practice in this way, you look back on it, you realize how really um, meant for application this is, not just for theoretical understanding. Or, and it's actually a very useful tool. You notice there's really not the sort of thing that I, the Buddha, will tell you you're good or bad. I will judge you. I will punish you. I will reward you. The whole system is within the nature. This is done with you. Your reflection on it is by you, and your liberation from it or enslavement to it is by you is also. But I'm giving you the mirror how by you can steer your way through this, and you already have what you need to get the feedback. And so you could say a session is like a mirror. What's a, what is a session? It's a mirror. So anyhow, um, this is where we went last night with class, and it was really um, quite enjoyable for me because I learned a lot from them. I, I wouldn't have... I, some of the things my students say, i just like, wow, I never thought of that. <laughs> and it's quite interesting. But the degree to which... And these are just first semester, first year students. The degree to which the little bit that we studied... And the five days they've been in retreat, how much they were able to connect this, I, I was quite impressed. Uh, and they didn't know that it was impressive. They were just doing what they were doing. But the sincerity by which they came to the session made this text much more real to them because now they knew that this was their only guide. Because, with, you know, there's no teacher per se anymore. And so the only guide they had was this text to steer by to guide them through these states. Um, and I finished by... Uh, telling them the, a story that they hadn't heard before you had, so um, I could bore you with it again. Some of you maybe haven't heard it, so I'll tell it again because it's a really good illustration of this. Um, and this, this is preceded by uh, Rahula was caught lying. So I, I, that's the framing of this isn't earlier. He was caught lying, as, as only little kids do. Adults don't do that anymore. <laughs> And he was blushing, and the Buddha then picked up on that, how are you feeling? 
and then use the mirror, you know, just say, if you look in the mirror, you'll see you're blushing and so on and so forth. So um, when we were in the early days of Goman, those of you who heard the story, you just meditate, you don't have to listen. Um, when you come into a session, one of the things you want to do, if you've done a couple sessions, after a couple sessions, you realize there's certain patterns that you have that are pretty strong and that you didn't get rid of in the first session, and maybe you didn't get rid of in the second session, the third session, you're going to nail them. Uh, it could be anger, it could be jealousy, it could be laziness. Um, a lot of people find it has to do with food. Because the food is regulated, you know, you're doing the session, and you don't eat until lunchtime with everybody else. So this urge you have to jump up and go to the refrigerator or go hit a, you know, a vending machine or something, there's no vending machines at the session anyhow. So there's no place to go. So these urges that come up really become quite powerful. And to powerful enough that you're sitting there and you know, it's like 10.30 and the, the meal is at 11. But at 10.30, you know, you've restrained this desire for your appetite, immediate gratification. You restrained it now and you're watching the arisal of that, that, that thirst for whatever it is you're fantasizing about. And then from the back, one of the monks brings in the tray of food. So there's these little bowls, I don't have you seen it. So just before the meal, little bowls of food are put out as symbolic offerings to the um, Buddhists and Bodhisattvas. And invariably they take, you know, some of the best things that are available for lunch that day. So there's going to be some curry and sweet curry rice. There's going to be a nice dessert piece and then some steaming, you know, buns or jowds or something like that. So you're sitting there like this and that monk or nun walks by that tray and <laughs> and you, you know, you're just glad and the salivation starts coming at that point. Um, so some people realize uh, the thing that they really don't have a control over is the sweet tooth. So they realize they're really sugar junkies. Um, and again, I'll tell you, Hung Shur had this too because he, he, his father uh, was a diabetic and his father was from Canada. And so his father grew up with all this maple syrup and all these you know, things, and then when he became diabetic, he couldn't have it. So his mother knew his father wanted it really badly, so she never put any sweets on the table, and then she'd lock the sweets in a high cupboard so that he wouldn't get at them out of an uncontrolled urge and hurt himself. Well, Hung Shur and his, you know, brother and sister had to suffer through this. So when Hung Shur would go to a friend's house, and they, you know, here's a chocolate cake for dessert or whatnot, and it's like, wow, <laughs> we don't get that at home. So as a result... Um, when we were practicing, uh, there's not as many available and so forth. So one of the monks had this sort of same thing, but it, it, for him it was particular, it was berry pies. He really had it for berry pies. And so he said, every session, um, it, this overcomes me. It's not a bad thing. Berry pies aren't good or bad, but it overcomes me. I become obsessed for wanting berry pies when I'm sitting and it's like, wow, this is really stupid. You know, I should be, I want to get enlightened, and I'm there, and I'm about to enter Samadhi, and I start seeing the blueberry pie, and I see the cherry pie, and it's like this, so I'm going to lick this. I am not going to give in to this at this session. And even if they bring it for the meal offering, I am not going to eat it. And he was, he was actually a Navy SEAL and before he came in, so he, he thought, man, I've done this thing, I've swam in waters that people wouldn't even think of dipping their toe in, I can do this. Um... And so he's sitting there, and he got into about three or four days, and he was doing really good. And then suddenly in the, one of the sessions, this urge just came up, and it was like uncontrollable to him. And he still had a few bucks in his pocket. And so right after lunch, when there's a little walking break, he went around the corner. There was a little bakery um, from Golden Mountain around the corner. And at those times, he used to wear these robes, these were, um, high chings, they're called. And these are not high ching, but the high ching had this big drop down sleeve. Have you seen those robes? They look very ceremonial. They're drop down like that and they're hollow inside. So there's, you know, it's just cloth, it's like a big sack and you have them on both sides. They're very ceremonial looking. So he went in and he got like um, six or four of these little berry pies. And he's walking back, he's eating one, he's eating two, he's eating three, and he's getting, eating four, and all of a sudden he's back in front of the monastery and he's got two left. And he made the vow publicly. That was the other thing he did before the retreat. This time, you guys watch. I'm not going to do this. <laughs> and so he didn't know what to do with the pie. He could have dumped them, but he thought, no, it's a waste of two good pies. I don't want to dump them. So he put one in one sleeve and one in the other sleeve and then went back in and was, you know, circumventing, sitting, circumventing, sitting in the meantime. And you can't see it because the sleeves naturally hang down. So you've got two little pies on the bottom. Nobody's going to notice. 
And so while he was sitting, now he was like, oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to have these pies. Have these pies. <laughs> that, was, that became his mantra. And so it was time for bed. Everybody went to sleep. And he kept these two pies. And he thought, if I eat them, because we had roommates and things like that, they'll heal and smell. there would be crumbs and everything. I'll go up to the roof. We had three stories of Go Mountain. And so he went to the bathroom. It was about 1 or 1.30. Everybody's asleep. And it's, Gold Mountain then was an old mattress factory that had been converted and had the old windows, you know, with those ropes and weights. So when you lifted up those old weights and pulleys going, ling, 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 ling. <laughs> so he sat there, he, said, he told me this afterwards, it took him 20 to 25 minutes <laughs> to lift that up so it wouldn't make any noise. I mean, he was in this intense samadhi, just pushing this thing up, pushing it, and finally he got enough so he crawled through. So he crawled through, got on the fire escape, and went on top of the roof. And it was a moonlit night, and he thought, and then he pulled out his pies. And he takes a bite into one, and he says, oh, my God, you know, like that. But he said, I feel guilty, I feel, you know, but all this, but nobody's going to see me, but, you know, it's like, but I still, you know, he's going through all the torment and whatnot, but he's eating the pie. And then suddenly he hears somebody on the fire escape, and he looks over, and he sees his bald head coming up on the fire escape, and he realizes it's the master. And he's going, oh, God, it's, it's the teacher. Oh, what am I going to do here? So again, he could have thrown the pies over the side, but still he didn't want to get rid of the pies. So he starts shoving the pie in. The master comes up. He whips out his meditation beads. And he's going, Ami Tofo, Ami Tofo, Ami Tofo. Going in circumambulation, pretending he's reciting the Buddha's name and shoving the pie in with the other hand. So he goes this way, and when the master goes this way to meet him, he turns and reverses, and it's going like this on the roof. And, he's, and finally, he gets, he gets, finally takes, and the beads are hanging down like this, and they're, they're dripping now with juice, and his robe is covered in juice, and he just shoves them finally in, and his mouth is all covered with juice, and they meet face to face. <laughs> and so the master's looking at him, he's looking at the master. He's thinking, I am going to get scolded. I'm going to get blasted. He caught me in my hypocrisy and, you know, and everything. And all the master did was look at him and smile and say, how does it feel? And then turned around and went inside. And he, just, he said, I sat there for like a half an hour thinking about what am I feeling? What, is, what do you mean by that? And he, he went through all the feelings that he had you know, stirred up with this, with the vow, with the breakdown of the vow, with the covering, with the concealment, with, and he said, look what I've done to myself. And he said at that moment, he actually broke through that barrier that he had for it. But it was based on how does it feel? This, this reflection was actually used, and if you know how it feels, you will know the answer to how you should proceed from here on in. Why would you want to be concealing your life from, from others because what would that feel like? You're not being true. And if you're not true, how can you have true? You know? So he went through all this. And it was a perfect teaching for someone who was very strong-willed um, and very independent, but also very soft, because all it asked him to do was reflect, what does this feel like as you are in this state now? So I, I use the story um, to illustrate that not only can teachers use this uh, with the student-teacher relationship, because <laughs> But it's actually the most profound door of entry into the Dharma is to be mindful, not of something else. You know, say, I'm mindful of the Buddha, I'm mindful of the Bodhisattva. That's the background that allows you enough stillness to be mindful of yourself and your own habits and energies and thoughts so you can do this reflection and gain liberation. So the mindfulness of the Buddha and Bodhisattva is only a stopping device to allow this kind of mindfulness to happen. When this happens, then there's actual change and transformation. Um, so anyhow, I'm happy that at least in the first semester with the experiment of this course that I think it's going the way we're hoping it's going, and I'm excited to, to continue this model because I think it's, uh, it's quite, quite useful. Uh, so anyhow. That's it for today. Next week we'll go back to Hanshan and uh, continue. But uh, they'll be finishing up, I think, Saturday night. They finish up and they'll be over with. And then people next week will be back. We can ask them, how did it feel? <laughs> See what they have to say. Um, the one thing they, some of the students who hadn't done it really enjoyed is there's one ritual devotion at night. And I remember this. I liked it a lot, too. It's called the Great Transference. And at the end of the day at 9 o'clock, they do this sort of chanting, and they begin this energetic walking and reciting and chanting. And it's very uplifting and very uh, beautiful.
but what you're doing is you're transferring all the energy of that day out universally to all beings. So it's like all that effort you put into it for your own work and self-transformation, your, your mind is going to the thought, I don't do this only for myself, but I do it for all beings. It's sort of like the meta-contemplation that radiates out. And so at the end of the day, it's really a nice way to close because any smallness you might have had that you're still lingering on to, you can just let it go at that moment and just let it go out. And even if you thought it wasn't good, the fact that you're struggling with your afflictions is actually quite a contribution to world peace, if you want to look at it that way. So anyhow, that's a little bit on the session. Announcements, anything? I don't think so. We have next week, I think we're mostly still see, Monday. We're not having class Monday, I think, or Thursday next week still. But the rest of the classes are still on. Tomorrow night, a lecture here? Yes. OK. We'll have a lecture. Oh.